like to thank, first of all, um, Ashton and Cotton all for inviting me to speak here today. Um, it's lovely seeing um, so many people on. It's lovely seeing um, some faces, but not all faces. So um, I think without further ado, I know my mom is watching. So welcome mom and, and my sister. And um, also I've seen um, Lucy from Manor House. Um, some of you may know we've got a health um, retreat down there at Manor House and she's on at the moment and anybody else. Um, I don't want to miss anybody out, but just welcome everyone. And I am going to ask if you can pray for me throughout this um, sermon, throughout this time. For some reason, my voice is, is going and I know that it's probably due to the topic that I will be speaking about. So please pray for me as you listen to this sermon. So without further ado, I'm going to start. So one of the films that my family loved to watch when I was growing up was Samson and Delilah, Samson and Delilah. And that particular one, for those who are over a certain age, you will know it. It's the one that was starring Victor Mature. And I know Sadie, if Sadie was on, she would say, yes, she would definitely know that. And in the final scene of that film, it shows that Samson is being led into the temple by Delilah. Now, I'm not sure which Bible the director was reading, but certainly not, it wasn't my Bible, because my Bible tells me that he was led into the temple by a lad. So a small boy led him into the temple. And Judges chapter 16, verses 29 says, Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple and he braced himself one arm on the right and then the other on the left that's what my bible tells me and then the temple came crashing down destroying all of god's enemies now as we know a pillar helps to support and hold up a building if the pillars fall down, then the building will come crashing down. Now the Seventh-day Adventist church was built on great pillars of our faith, which gives the reason why we are Seventh-day Adventists and why we are called a peculiar people, a holy nation, separate and distinct from all other people on the face of the earth. And that's not bragging, that's what God says. If the pillars fall down, then our church, the Seventh-day Adventist, will come crashing down. But God's not going to allow that to happen. Just to remind many of you, and maybe some of you are hearing this for the first time, but the pillars of our faith includes the state of the dead, the sanctuary message, which includes the investigative judgment, the second coming, the three angels messages, the spirit of prophecy, the faith of Jesus and the law, which includes the Sabbath. Thank you for that, Maureen, for doing the Ten Commandments. I know that the Holy Spirit is working today. Now, these pillars allows the church to stand and not fall. But the enemy wants to tear down these great pillars of our faith, especially the Sabbath. The title of my sermon today, church, is Who Should We Believe? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, you see that the enemy is at work today. Heavenly Father, I know that greater are you that is in me than he that is in the world. And I just pray, Lord, that you will take full control. And I thank you, Lord, that your word will not return unto you void. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we have been given a special message that must be given to all the world before the imminent return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's an urgent, compelling message of good news. It's an urgent appeal for men and women everywhere to prepare for the soon coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This great message is called the Three Angels Messages, and it is found in the book of Revelation, chapter 14. 
Now, the first message starts in verse six of chapter 14. Follow with me. And it says, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, is come come and worship him that made heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. This verse is telling us that we are, we are called to worship God who is our creator. This message is to go to all the world. The Bible gives us the evidence of who it was that made the heaven, the earth, the sea and the fountains of water. So first of all, in the first book of the Bible, the first chapter and the first verse, Moses wrote, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then in the New Testament, John speaking of Jesus wrote, all things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. That's John 1 and 3. And then Paul clearly states in the book of Ephesians 3, 9, he clearly states that God who created all things through Jesus Christ. Jesus said himself, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is established. So at least three writers declare that the creator of this world is Jesus Christ himself. So after creation, after the creation of Adam and Eve on the sixth day, the Bible says that God looked at everything that he had made and he said that it was very good. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it, he had rested from all his work, which God had created and made. That's Genesis 2, um, verse 2 to 3. So that's three times in these two verses that God clearly says, which he had made. Church repetition deepens impression. So God blessed and sanctified the seventh day, setting it apart as a holy day. And as long as we set aside the seventh day to worship our creator, we will never ever lose sight of who we are, where we came from, and why we are here, and also what our destiny will be. We will know who, where, why, and what our destiny will be. But looking down through the ages, God who is omniscient, he knew that man would forget the Sabbath. You know, I've shared this story before, maybe at Cartonal, that one of my good friends, she tells the story that when she was growing up, she always celebrated her birthday on the 19th of November, the same day that I was born, the same day that Patricia was born, and the same day that Marva was born, and anybody else who shares that day. And it was only when she went to get a birth certificate when she was about 18 years old, that she realized that the birth certificate said that she was born on the 11th of November and not the 19th. But because she had traditionally celebrated her birthday on the wrong day, she continues to do so today. Now church, the majority of the Christian world is like my friend celebrating the birthday of this world on the wrong day. But God blessed and sanctified the seventh day, not the sixth day, according to the Muslims, 
and not the first day, according to the majority of the Christian world, and not even every day, according to T.D. Jakes. There are over 30,000, and that's an amazing number in itself, 30,000 Christian denominations around the world. And the question is, can a small remnant of people be right and the majority of the Christian world be wrong regarding the seventh day Sabbath? So who should we believe? You see, there is no mathematical reason for there to be a seven day week. We were taught in school that a year is based on the time it takes the earth to rotate around the sun. A month is measured by the moon orbiting around the earth every 30 days. A day is when the earth rotates on its own axis. But there is no reason, church, for there to be a seven day week except from the creation week. You see, the number seven is a special number and it is God's perfect number. It signifies completeness and is used hundreds of times throughout the Bible. For example, we have seven days of creation. It was seven days after Noah entered the ark that the floods came. There were seven fat and seven lean cows in Pharaoh's dream. Samson had seven locks. It was seven times that Elijah prayed for rain on Mount Carmel. It was seven times that the Israelites marched around the walls of Jericho with seven priests and seven trumpets. And on the seventh day, the wall came tumbling down. The book of Revelation has seven churches, seven golden candlesticks, seven last plagues, seven trumpets, seven thunders, and seven seals. Now, time doesn't allow me to go on, but I'm sure you get the picture. The number seven is God's perfect number. And knowing this, it is highly unlikely that God would bless and sanctify any other day of the week. God is consistent and the servant of the Lord says, order is heaven's first law. God is a God of order. God is not inconsistent when it comes to his business. And God knows what is best in every single situation, but man thinks that he knows best. So in the 1700s, France decided to start a 10 day week, but it had to abolish it after nine years, mainly due to the fact that the workers were exhausted with 10 days of labor and just one day of rest. Then in 1929, wanting to get rid of religion, Russia decided to change from a seven day week to a five day week. And that change led to a complete breakdown of the family unit, <coughs> excuse me. Of the family unit and the experiment was reversed after two years. Church, God's ways are perfect. Six days labor and one day rest, amen? Now, let's have a look at some more evidence regarding this great pillar of our faith, the Sabbath. Back with Moses, when God's people were in bondage in Egypt, they had forgotten their roots and also they had forgotten God's holy Sabbath day. So God called Moses to lead his people out of Egypt and into the promised land so that they could keep the Sabbath. Now, during their extended journey, God provided the Israelites with manna from heaven for food. But there was one amazing thing about this manna. It only appeared on the ground for six days a week. God said, six days, you shall gather it. 
but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. And that's Exodus 16, verse 26. So a double portion of manna fell on the sixth day so that the Israelites would not have to go out and gather it on the seventh day. But some of the people, people being people, disregarded God's instructions and went out on the Sabbath to gather the manna, but they found none. Then God said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Exodus 16, 28. So from this episode, we can see that the Sabbath was observed by God's people long before the Ten Commandments were given at Mount Sinai. The fourth commandment was given to make sure that God's people would not forget his special day. It is the only commandment that begins with the word remember. And I'm going to ask Ruby now if she would read Exodus 20 verses 8 to 11 for me. This is from the NIV version. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is our Sabbath day. The Lord your God on on it you shall not do any work neither you nor your son or daughter nor your male or female servant nor your animals or nor any foreigners residing in your town for in six days the lord made the heavens and the earth the sea and all that is in them but the rest but he rested on the Sabbath, seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ruby. Thank you so much for that. You see, God wanted man to remember his memorial of creation, the seventh day Sabbath. If man had always remembered this memorial of creation, the problems that man faces today, a forgotten God, a meaningless life, an identity crisis would all be solved. There would be no evolutionist, no humanist, no feminist, no racist, and no atheist. So church, who do you believe? God is very specific. He wants us to remember that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. No other day will do. God says the seventh day Sabbath is my holy day. The word Sabbath even, the word Sabbath even has the word Abba, meaning father or daddy in it. That's amazing. I didn't even realize that after nearly 30 years. It has the name Abba within the word Sabbath. Another point then is that the Sabbath is also a sign between God and man. Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 20 says, Hallow my Sabbaths and they shall be a sign between me and you that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. You see the Sabbath is a sign or a seal for us to know who God is. In Bible times, a king's ring contained a seal, which was used to stamp and seal letters or decrees or laws. The king's seal was of great significance. It contained his name, his title, and his territory. The seal of a king could not be changed even by the king himself. So when we look at the fourth commandment, it contains God's name, the Lord thy God. It contains his title, creator, and his, and his territory, which is heaven, earth, and the sea. 
So the seventh day Sabbath is a sign or a seal of God representing his authority as our creator. And it cannot be changed by anyone. That's why the papacy can only think to change times and laws. That's, it says that in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. But God says that I am the Lord, I change not. No one can change the Sabbath day to Sunday. Now, some Christians today will ask, how can we be certain which day is the Sabbath day? Well, if we go back to Webster's Dictionary, it makes it clear. It says that Saturday is the seventh day of the week. And sometimes we ought to ask those who worship on the Sunday how they can be sure that Sunday is the first day of the week. We can also go to the Jews who today continue to celebrate the Sabbath on Saturday, the seventh day of the week. So the same Sabbath of creation is the day that we call Saturday today. Now, if the day had been changed or forgotten between Adam and Moses, then God would have rectified it when he wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger. If the Sabbath had been changed or lost between the time of Moses and Jesus, then surely Jesus would have set the record straight. You know, it was almost, almost 30 years ago, actually, 30 years ago in August, that I was invited to attend a crusade. And at first, I was brought up in a Pentecostal church. So at first, I thought, no way, no way. You know, the Adventists, they worship on the wrong day. So there's no way that I'm going to this crusade. But to cut a long story short, I ended up going. And on the very first night, the evangelist Fitz Henry, and some of you older ones who have been around for a long time, I can see Sadie smiling, um, will remember Fitz Henry and the campaigns that we had back in the early 90s. And what Fitz Henry said on that first day was that he would give £1,000 to anyone who could show from the Bible that the Sabbath was changed to Sunday. And that sealed it for me because I knew that no one, if everybody could find that if it was in the Bible, right? And he wasn't a multi-billion billionaire that could pay everybody a thousand pounds. So I knew that if I was coming back to church, that it would have to be a Sabbath keeping church, a Bible believing church. There was nowhere else that I was convicted to go. So back then, when I was studying about the Sabbath, I loved the fact, and I still do today, that in over 108 languages, the seventh day Sabbath means the Sabbath or the holy day. So in Arabic, it's Sabbat, which means Sabbath or holy day. In Spanish, it's Sabado. In Indonesia, it's Sabtu. In Ethiopia, it's sandbag and it goes on and on. But more recently, when I was studying about the Sabbath roots in Africa, I found out that in Ghana, Saturday is called, in, in their dialect, in their language, it's called I am that I am's day, which is the name that God told Moses to say to the children of Israel, I just found that amazing. I am that I am's day. So David Livingstone and the missionaries did not necessarily bring the Christianity to Africa. It was there all the time. I am that I am's day is Saturday, the Sabbath. The seventh day Sabbath is and always will be God's special day. Amen. Now, Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, kept the Sabbath. Luke chapter four, verse 16 says, so he came to Nazareth 
where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Many people today are chasing celebrities, influencers, and rich men to learn and to adopt their ways. Some of them have millions of followers, but Jesus said, follow me and put your trust in me and not in man. Jesus also expected Christians to keep the Sabbath after his death because he said, and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath day. Jesus was talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, which took place 35 years after Jesus died. And Jesus still expected the early church to be still keeping the Sabbath day. Now the true meaning of keeping the Sabbath was demonstrated by the devoted followers of Jesus after his crucifixion. They left the work of anointing Jesus's body and they rested according to the commandments of God until after the Sabbath. The women would not even break the Sabbath to anoint the Lord of the Sabbath's dead body. And yet we can easily justify why we do certain things to break the Sabbath according to God's law. Ellen White said that no partial obedience to the Sabbath, no divided interest is accepted by God. Strict compliance with the requirements of heaven is needed. No partial obedience, but strict compliance is needed today. Also church, Acts 17 verses 1 to 2 tells us that after the resurrection of Jesus, that Paul, as his custom was, went into the synagogue of the Jews and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. In fact, throughout the Acts of the Apostle, it records many meetings that Paul held on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath then was kept by Jesus, the apostles, and also the early church. But many denominations today, they believe that we no longer have to keep the Sabbath. They always point to Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 to 17, to say that the Sabbath was done away with at the cross, and it is now a shadow of things to come but they confuse the two laws that were given by Moses. Both the ceremonial and the moral law or the Ten Commandments had Sabbath. Both of them had Sabbath. The seventh day Sabbath always occurred on the seventh day of the week, but the ceremonial Sabbath could occur on any day of the week. The seventh day Sabbath um, commandment was written, as I said before, by the finger of God himself on tablets of stone, which signified permanency. The ceremonial law, though, was written on cloth or paper or skin by the hand of Moses. Another point, the seventh day Sabbath was made for man before he had fallen. The ceremonial Sabbath came into existence after man had fallen. And the Ten Commandments were placed in the ark directly under the mercy seat, while the ceremonial Sabbath, the ceremonial laws were placed at the side beside the ark. There is a difference between the moral laws and the ceremonial laws. Ellen White said this while she was in vision. She spoke of um, seeing on one tablet, there were four commandments and we know that. And on the other, there were six. The four on the first commandment shone brighter than the six, but the fourth commandment shone above them all. She said that there was a halo 
of glory around it. Isn't that amazing? That's taken from early writings, page 32. She continued to say, I saw that the Sabbath commandment was not, was not nailed to the cross. I saw that God had not changed the Sabbath for God never changes, amen? So there is church, a clear difference between God's unchanging fourth commandment and the Sabbath of the ceremonial law. That was the one that was nailed to the cross. Now, another point that I want you to remember is that the Sabbath, which was instituted and celebrated before sin, and it will also be celebrated after sin is banished forever. Praise God. Again, in the book, Early Writings, page 16 this time, we are told that at Jesus' second coming, when the dead in Christ shall rise first, and those who are alive will be caught up to meet him in the air. Ellen White writes that we all entered the cloud together and were seven days ascending to the sea of glass. So this means, church, and this is amazing, this means that everyone on the journey to heaven, which will take seven days, will have the privilege and the opportunity of keeping the Sabbath. So all those who died without knowing about the Sabbath, all those who died before the 1840s when the Sabbath was became prominent again, they will have that opportunity with Jesus as they travel to heaven of celebrating their first Sabbath. Isn't God amazing? Then when we get to heaven, God says, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship me before the Lord. Isaiah 66, verse 23. So throughout all eternity, God's people will celebrate the Sabbath to honor their creator and now their redeemer. So it makes sense that all God's people should celebrate, should remember the Sabbath now. The Sabbath was meant to be kept perpetually throughout all generations. So knowing this friends, who should we believe, man or God? You know, we have a beautiful Sabbath message to share to the world. The Sabbath commandment has been trampled upon and we are called upon to repair the breach of the law. The man of sin who exalts himself above God and thinks to change times and laws is ready to set up the image of his antichrist system, which is Sunday worship. Church, time is short. And the work which the church has failed to do in a time of peace and prosperity, she will have to do in a terrible crisis under discouraging and forbidding circumstances. Ellen White wrote that in the fifth um, volume of the Testimonies, page 464. The third angel's message in Revelations chapter 14, verses nine to 10 says, if any man worship the beast and his image, that Sunday, and receive his mark in his forehead, or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Ellen White said again that she was shown, I like when she says she was shown because we know it's not an opinion, it's what God is saying. So she says she was shown that the people who received the third angel's messages and raise the voice of warning to the people to keep the commandments of God and his law, that in response to this warning, many will embrace the Sabbath of the Lord. 
isn't that amazing? Many, if we share the three angels' messages, will embrace the Sabbath of the Lord. So, church, again, my question is, who do you believe? Who should we believe? Friends, take heed that no man deceives you. Matthew 24, Jesus says that to his disciples. Choose to believe the one who said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You see, the God of all knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and truth says what he means. And he means what he says. You cannot add or take away or change any part of the word of God. So friends, in closing, we are the messengers and today we have so many ways of communicating even during this lockdown period. There are emails, text messages, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, phone calls and much, much more. Zoom platforms. You know, many years ago, the telegram was the method of quick communication around the world. And you had to pay for each word. So messages were kept short and to the point. And a telegram usually meant bad news. And I can remember when I was out working in the Middle East, I remember receiving a telegram and I just started to panic. My manager kept saying, Val, it's good news. It's good news, but I couldn't hear him. I was just panicking, thinking something had happened to my family back home. He had to literally grab a hold of me, grab a hold of me and say, Val, it's good news. And at that point, I grabbed the telegram, opened it, read it, and it said, baby girl born 5th of the 12th, 1988, mother and baby doing well. Love, Sandra. Friends, it was fantastic news, but I didn't believe what my manager was saying. Now we have a fantastic message to share to the world. There are people who are dying to know the truth or who will die if they don't know the truth. There are people that we will literally have to grab a hold of to get their attention to share this truth. And don't worry about who will be offended when you speak the truth. Worry about who will be misled, deceived and destroyed if you don't. Our duty is to love the Lord your God and to walk in his ways and to keep all of his commandments and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Amen. Amen. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Friends, it will take everything, everything to serve the Lord in these last days. And Jesus is saying to all of us today, believe me, follow me and serve me. Choose you this day who you will serve. If anyone wants to serve the Lord with me, just raise your hands where you are. Just raise your hands wherever you are. And we will pray. Let, let us pray. Dear kind and loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for your commandments. We thank you for the Sabbath day, dear Father God. We thank you for showing us once more, reminding us, dear Father God, how special this Sabbath day is to you, dear Father God. Lord, we want to follow you. We want to believe you and we want to serve you today, dear Father God, but we know that it will take everything, dear Father God, to serve you fully 
Heavenly Father, we pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We pray that you will tabernacle with us, dwell within our hearts, dear Lord, that the commandments, dear Father God, as we hide them in our hearts, that we will do according to your will. So I pray, dear Father God, for the members of this church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, dear Father God, that this will be a recommitment, dear Father God, that we are saying that we want to follow you all the way. We want to serve you with all our might, dear Father God. And for those who are hearing this message for the first time, dear Lord, I pray that you will touch their hearts, dear Lord, that they will taste and see, Father, that you are good and that your commandments are clean and right and pure, dear Father God, and that they too will learn to follow you all the way. Heavenly Father, be with us now, I pray, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.